J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, everyone. I'm J.T. Crowley, and today I'm delighted to welcome Wayne Edwards from the state of Montana in the United States. He describes himself as a multi-genre author, as his books are aimed at different age ranges with varying storylines. Predominantly, the books are aimed at the very young to the young mid-grade students in school age. And we're going to talk about a couple of his books, Buster the Bridger Mountain Bear, who's aimed at very young um, children, Pacer Cooley Chronicles, who's aimed at the the mid-grade children and adults, And briefly, we're going to touch upon his latest book that he's working on, A Stone's Throw, which he hopes will be out shortly. Wayne, it's a tremendous pleasure to talk to you about your book, so I would like to welcome you on the show. Come and join me. John, happy to be here. Happy to be with you. Brilliant. Wayne, can you tell the listeners, the viewers, you know, a little bit about yourself and why you write? Well, uh, John, as you mentioned, uh, I'm from I'm from the state of Montana uh, in the United States. Uh, that's a northern uh, northern state, up uh, bordering uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, Canada, and we're uh, we're a very large uh, state geographically, the fourth largest state in the union. Uh, but yet, uh, only one state, our neighboring uh, Wyoming, is of less population than we are. We, uh, uh, to give you a little example, uh, square miles wise, we are we're three times as large as England uh, from a square mile acreage, and uh, we just hit a million people as in, in total population here. Uh, four or five years ago. So uh, we're basically an agricultural uh, rural state. Uh, Largest city in our state is uh, just barely over 100,000. So uh, uh, that gives you a little flavor of where I, uh, about Montana and where I grew up. And even more so, uh, speaking of the rural aspect, uh, I grew up in the center of the state, uh, which is wheat and cattle country uh, at a very small little town. And uh, let me just tell you what what small means in in my vernacular. Uh, Many people think a town of 300,000 is small. They would certainly think 30,000 is small and would think 3,000 would be super small. And so the town I grew up in and spent uh, most of my working life in was a town of 300 people. So we are definitely talking, uh, you know, very, very rural. And the county that we live in uh, is larger than the state of Connecticut. And, but yet there's only 10,000 people in the entire, in the entire county. So we are indeed rural and, uh, so again, I was born and raised in this little town called, called Denton up in central Montana. And uh, upon uh, getting my higher education, I ended up returning to, to that town and, uh, and worked for 30 years in the uh, little family owned uh, bank that my grandfather started in 1929. So that's, Pretty much my background and uh, Pacer Cooley, uh, that, that book is based upon on my experience there as well as being a banker. I did what you, what you generally do in small towns is uh, you do whatever you're asked to do to help your community. And uh, so I even spent a six year stint as the, as the head football coach at our little, at our little high school. And, uh, and that really the, is the basis of the book Pacer Cooley Chronicles. It's not 
totally ab about that, but uh, it's a fiction story, but it's based upon on my experience there and that rural small small town as the football coach there. It sure is a small rural community. And when you read the books, everybody, this is the um, Pesa Cooley book. But before we start on to look at that one, I want to go to uh, your book, um, Buster, the Bridger Mountain Bear. Now, this is for very young kids. It's an illustrated book. The pictures in here are absolutely fabulous. And there are 12 endearing animal characters, all of which can be found in the wilds of Montana. So this is, again, this is all about where uh, Wayne comes from, the wildlife there. And the simple little story here is just absolutely so sweet and endearing why did you write this story why did you write well, uh, spill the beans here <laughs> well buster uh came about uh because buster was a bedtime story that i had made up with numerous adaptations over the years but uh, that i told countless times to uh, our three daughters and subsequently uh, our eight grandchildren. And when I retired from the bank, uh, my three daughters encouraged me to, to write actually the concept of, of Buster and secondly, the, the concept of which ended up to be Pacer Cooley. But to be honest with you, John, I think they were, they were simply afraid that uh, I was going to drive their mother crazy by being around the house all the time <laughs> with nothing to do in my retirement. So they, they said, Dad, I think you need to get, why don't you get Buster put on, put on paper and, and, and do a little book. So that's, that's how Buster came about. I mean, when you look at Buster, he's a, he's a black bear and he's got himself in a bit of predicament here. And you know, you've got all these 12 characters, you know, you've got Billy the Bob, Bobcats, you've got Brutus the Badger, Mortimer, Morton Mouse, Oliver Wendell, Al the Third, Katerina Cat, the Cougar, and of course, Buster the Bear, plus all the other characters. Now, they, they're all there because Buster's got his head stuck somewhere and they're all working together like any animals would do as a community to sort Buster out. Just give us a little flavor here, Wayne, as to what the storyline is, but don't give the plot away. <laughs> Sorry, well, basically, <laughs> Buster, uh, who's just, he's a young black bear, as you mentioned, and he's curious. And so he's sniffing around for, for honey, insects, whatever, and ends up sticking his head in a, in a fallen log. And gets his head stuck, can't get out. And so Gabby Gopher, who is the main social director in the entire mountain, uh, she's a bit of a gossip. Uh, she's she is. pretty nosy. But she, is. but she also has a heart of gold, and uh, she's very willing to help everybody, anybody in need. So she finds Buster in his predicament first. And she orchestrates uh, the recovery, so to speak, or the escape uh, from Buster from the from the log. And without giving the story away, uh, it involves all of these animals that you just mentioned, uh, starting with, in particular, with the sagest uh, animal or bird on the on the mountain who is. Oliver Wendell Owl III, uh, who, who all the animals go to when they, when they need some, some advice. And so he develops a plan and all of these animals uh, are brought in together and they work collectively uh, to, with a lot of teamwork involved to, uh, to get Buster, Buster's head unstuck from that log. Even Grumpy Brutus the Badger. Even Brutus joined. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, did you enjoy? Absolutely. <laughs> did you enjoy <laughs> working with Gina Dawes, the illustrator here? Oh, she was, she was wonderful, and and 
and this was my first children's book. And Gina is a very, she's an awesome uh, artist and has her own studio and uh, where we live now in Bozeman, Montana. And, uh, and so I had, I, I knew her and uh, was a, an admirer of her, of her work. And so when I started to think about who am I going to get to illustrate this, I thought, well, I'll give Gina a call. And I didn't think she'd ever done anything like that. And, and indeed, once I got a hold of her, uh, she said, no, I, I, I've never done any illustrations uh, or children's illustrations. And, but she said, I, I love the idea and, and uh, let's, let's give it a go. go. Yeah, Let's give it a go. Exactly. Yeah, she and as as you said, she she did a wonderful job. And the most important thing in any children's book is the illustrator. Uh, she know, brought the characters to life. That's what brings the whole book to life. Absolutely. Yes, Wayne. I want to move on to your next book, Pesa Cooley Chronicles, which for me is aimed at slightly older children more young teens and possibly adults. Now, this is a chunky book, everyone, um, with a fair number of chapters. So as to give you all a flavour um, and an insight, so to speak, we're going to concentrate on seven or eight of the chapters. For me, Wayne, the chapters, Edna's meeting with Lester and Edna's second meeting with Lester caught my eye. Edna, now for me, Edna is the domineering matrix head of school, she's used to getting her way with what she wants. She rules the roost. That's her type of character she is. And she very much, Wayne, reminded me of Miss Trunchbull, the headmistress in Roll Dolls Matilda. <laughs> and I hope you don't mind me making the comparison there, but she just did. And that's why I want to talk about these, these two chapters. And of course, Lester is the athletics director of sport at the school and is under the cosh for poor performance. Tell us about these two chapters. What's the significance here? I just loved them. Well, again, uh, to, to begin with, uh, Edna is an iconic character in this. And the fictional Pacer Cooley is very much like, like my original little town of Denton. It's a little small rural town up in central Montana, also of 300 people. And so she's lived there all her life. She's 72 years old. She's at a very young age. Her father died and she was a, she took over. She ran the ranch there. Uh, she was a English teacher at the school, at the high school there for, for almost 50 years. And upon retiring from teaching, uh, uh, she's now, can, runs the, the school with an iron fist as the school board uh, uh, chairperson. And so sure does. Edna is, is extremely, uh, as you mentioned, uh, she's pretty hard headed and she's very demanding and she believes in education and is, and not only in education, but She's a big, big time sports fan. And so what gets into these chapters was several years prior, uh, she had hired Lester Brewster as the superintendent of the school. And as what often happens when you go to a small school, now again, there's, there's only a hundred kids from kindergarten all the way through senior and high school. So, uh, He's, he has to wear a lot of hats. It's not just, he's the, not only the superintendent, he's the grade school and high school principal. He's the girls basketball coach. He's the girls volleyball coach. But unfortunately, uh, in Edna's eyes, uh, with him also being the athletic director, it was his responsibility to hire the last football coach. So Edna had been very unhappy with the Pacer Cooley. It had a long standing tradition starting with her uncle back in the thirties when he, when he coached the team. 
And uh, so she got used to, you know, a good solid tradition of, a, of football in particular. She didn't uh, like being beaten by those goddamn Catholics, did she? She didn't like uh, <laughs> the downward spiral of the uh, football program over the last five years. And I love how you mentioned the goddamn Catholics. She's, uh, there was the biggest rival between Pacer Cooley was, was a little private Catholic school called St. Francis. And and over the last number of years, uh, they have been very good uh, in all sports, but in particular in football. And it, it seemed that the Pacer Cooley had only beaten them like once in the last 10 years. And that did not go over very well with, with Edna. And Edna called them, uh, she wouldn't even call them St. Francis. And it's not that she had anything against the Catholic uh, religion at all, even though she was Methodist, but uh, she would refer to them as the goddamn Catholics. And she was getting pretty tired of getting beat on a regular basis, like a drum, by the goddamn Catholics. So she, at this first meeting with Lester, who had hired this coach that had had a bunch of losing seasons. Uh, she said, you are going to fire him, fire him immediately. And we're going to begin the search for a new football coach. And uh, we're going to turn this thing around and we're going to beat the goddamn Catholics. And secondly, as your, since you hired yourself as yeah. AD to be the girls basketball and volleyball coach, uh, with all the talent that we had uh, last year with three of the Your Daughters, the Brewster girls, and with a fourth one coming, in, coming into high school the following year, uh, all of his girls were talented, but there was a lot of nitpicking going on. There was some jealousy. And when they got to the tournaments and were playing the good teams, uh, this all got in the way of... Uh, we'll talk of, about the Brewster sisters later. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and so he, she promptly fired uh, Lester from the head coach, head basketball and volleyball coach, and told him to begin his search uh, for, for those positions as well. She sure did. She's a very dominating matrix, is that enough? <laughs> Let's go to, uh, I loved the chapter, Luke and Madison. You know, um, Luke and Madison discover the Pace of Cooley Chronicles, this chapter. Now, they're both divorced, recently moved to Pace of Cooley High School. Um, and ha so how and why did you create these characters? You have them living side by side. Um, they like their barbecues. They like their food. So I thought, what's their role in the overall plot here? And what goes on in the Chronicles is very interesting, isn't it? Spill again. Yeah, yeah they, uh, they're they really a, certainly a main feature of the story, the, the two of them, uh, as as the book really follows the, the football season and the girls' basketball seasons, which uh, in those years, uh, this... The era, by the way, of Pacer Cooley is that this book is written in 1990, so uh, 30 some some years ago, and uh, so what they ended up what they ended up doing was, as you mentioned, coming off some, some tough tough divorce situations. Both of them wanted to change, uh, and without knowing each other before they got there, they both ended up uh, taking the head uh, coaching positions that, that were open. Uh, you mentioned the side-by-side -side rentals, which by the way, were, are owned by, by Edna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and so both of them are, you know, a little bit gun shy because of their recent uh, divorces. Uh, they're, certainly seems to be an immediate attraction between between the two of them. Uh, Madison has a delightful little 
11 year old daughter that uh, that uh, Luke uh, becomes immediately uh, he like he he really likes her and they develop a good re a good relationship long before he ever trusts himself to really uh, try to like Madison and take that to uh, uh, the next step, if you will. Of course, and, and Rosie's uh, her daughter, her 11 year old daughter. Yeah. Yeah. So then we get into, uh, as they're talking back and forth over the fence and the barbecues and so forth, uh, they come across the small town newspaper. Uh, Madison is familiar with small town newspapers because she's from a uh, another small town up in northern Montana, but Luke has always been at big schools, whether in Nebraska, uh, whether he was uh, when he was a student and uh, and when he was coaching, and so he's quite unfamiliar with the ways of, of small community life. So he gets the first look at this small town newspaper. It's only published; uh, an edition is only published twice a week. And once a month, there is, for every little surrounding town, and there's seven or eight of these little small towns that are about the same size as Pacer Cooley, and each of them has a correspondent, and they send in the com local community news from, from their community. And it essentially ends up being a, you know, kind of a little gossip column. And, now wait and on calls. wait on that one because we'll come to oh. that way because yeah. we'll come to Ethel. Hold on fire there, everyone. This is good, but we'll do this on Ethel. But I want to go to first uh, before we get to Ethel, the baker, mm, the, the good pies. Mm. I want to go to Dolph and Earl. Have questions for Luke that chapter. Now, Dolph is an interesting character. He's slightly different to all those around him due to his mental limitations. He's always anxious to know if he's on the bad list or not. Um, and how, has he avoided it this week? And then you've got Earl. Now, Earl, you have given this character, this boy, a little bit of a stammer. And he's trying to manipulate his way around Luke here by trying to say he's a lot heavier than what the figures say. And he's also a little bit taller than what the figures say so he can get into the teams. Now, I get the sense that these two boys are trying to impress all the time to show that their, their disabilities are not a distraction and that they're as good as anybody else on the sports field. Am I right here? And is this is what these two characters are about? It's, it's very typical of, uh, of small towns or small schools where when you're at a bigger school, you know, the freshmen play on a freshman team, sophomores play on a sophomore team or a JV team, and you usually don't play varsity until you're, you know, a junior, right? And a junior and senior. Well, when you get to a, a small school, uh, like we're talking about here at Pacer Cooley, uh, you know, there's only 17 total boys out for out for football for an eight-man football team, uh, and a whole bunch of them are going to end up being freshmen or sophomores. So they're really certainly not quite ready for prime time yet, right? And uh, <laughs> but as a coach, Luke's having to to deal particularly with Earl. Uh, he's, a, he's a scrawny little young, young freshman who wants nothing more than to be, to grow five inches, six, seven, eight inches taller. You know, I mean, he'd love to be 6'2 at 220 pounds. And unfortunately he's 5'2 and 97 pounds. So, Bit of a so he, uh, he's, he comes in before the first, first game and he he's been looking at the roster that the secretary has been printing out to send to the neighboring school that they're going to going to play in the opening game and of course sees that where he's listed uh, <clears throat> so he tries to manipulate Luke into 
you know, hey, I've been, mom's been cooking a lot more. You've got us weightlifting. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be, you know, by the end of the season, I'm going to, no doubt, I'm going to be 5'5", five, five, and I'll probably be 106 to 108 pounds, you know. And so he's just wondering, you know, couldn't we just go ahead and adjust that on the roster right now? So, uh, <laughs> and so here's Luke, who's used to coaching in big schools and, and, and not coaching freshmen. And uh, so this is a whole new deal to him, but he handles it wonderfully. And uh, they do, in fact, uh, make an adjustment on the roster. I think they get him up. And we'll leave it at that, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Wayne, and, uh, now you can come to Mrs. Grove, Ethel. Now, she's the elder. This, this is a lovely chapter, everybody. Mrs. Grove and the Pace of Cooley Chronicles. Ooh, yeah. Ethel is the elderly lady, famed for her pies, everyone. She's telling Sylvia Graham, the correspondent on the Pace of Cooley Chronicles, the local paper, how Luke and Madison are really, listen to this, really good neighbours. Well, there's nothing like a bit of juicy hot gossip to get the tongues wagging in the local community, never mind all the other boring stuff that's been printed. She's a bit of a gossip, isn't she? <laughs> of course, and that's, the, that's another one of the treasures of the small town. Small town correspondent, uh, as you mentioned, you know, pretty soon you're in a uh, agricultural community, so they start with the weather. They start with how are the how are the wheat and barley crops. What are cattle prices like? You know, and then once you get past that, uh, you got to fill in the rest of your column somehow, right? And uh, oh. so Sylvia, the the correspondent, she's been around the block a few times, and so uh, the old gals that uh, have some juicy news give her a call and that's what happened this is mrs grove who lives across right across the alley from uh, from madison and luke uh, she she gives them a call and she sees a little romance uh, possibly starting there and uh, she doesn't really come out and say that but she makes sure she says what a wonderful young neighbors they are and how oh, really lucky. good neighbors yes, yes. And we'll leave that story there because if you want to know what really goes on in that chapter everyone go and read the book let's go Wayne to oh I, I like this one because this is really a community uh, the royal community working together I love this chapter Wayne Edna gets a visit from the sheriff now she's not in trouble um, it's all about how the local community pull together when they hear of the demise of the old man Hollister's accent at Spring Creek's Bridge. And Edna is asked to get involved to support Tank, one of the young lads at the school, uh, who's on the Hollister farm. Now, this is life in rural Montana, isn't it, Wayne? All the community working together to support each other. And this is what it's about. Absolutely. You know, Tank, who's, who's by far the best, best football player on the on the team, uh, very strong, one of Montana's top uh, recruiting uh, prospects. And, uh, but he's come from a really tough home life. His father is a raging alcoholic who abused uh, both him and his, and his mother. So uh, his whole life uh, has been fraught by abuse and and Edna has kind of in her own rough way uh, has had long ago sort of taken him under her wing. And, uh, and the whole community, as you mentioned, uh, so when the, when the father uh, coming home drunk from, from one of the bars in Centertown uh, goes over the bridge into Spring Creek and dies, uh, the sheriff, knows uh, that Edna is kind of looks out for him. So he, he goes to Edna's home and, and before he goes to Tank, because Tank's the only, the only uh, offspring there, and says, hey, I just want you to know we just found Holl uh, Terrence Hollis, Hollister Sr. Uh, dead in the creek. Uh, 
I'm going to have to go over and tell Tank now, uh, would you come with me? And so what ends up resulting uh, from that is that Edna and a few of the other town, town leaders uh, uh, and the whole community, as you say, has kind of looked out for him, but in particular Edna and the and the main banker in town and mm -hmm. um, and Shanty, who we're going to get to, uh, they all get together to take care of all of the funeral arrangements and what have you. And it's just classic what happens. Oh, community in, working together in a, in a small community when something like this happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Now let's move on to the Brewster sisters. You know, Luke's. How shall I say it? Now, I, I love this chapter, you know, this is Madison. We hear Madison, she's lost it with these three sisters or these four sisters, you know. They're spoiled, they're selfish, they're damn right uncoachable. They're the four Brewster sisters, you know. They are Luke's, you know, uh, daughters. She's having a go at them and she's not afraid to do that, is she? They're unruly. <laughs> She is not, and that again is a no, another typical small town scenario where, where you have oftentimes a couple of, of siblings playing on the same team, certainly a bunch of cousins uh, that are playing on the same team. And, you know, oftentimes it goes, it goes very well. I had three daughters myself that uh, two of which, uh, played on the same teams for a number of years. They got along just, just fine. So it, it can go very well, but it can also go south when, uh, when mm -hmm. a little bit of jealousy and nitpicking and what have you uh, goes on. So Madison was able to control this early in the, in the season. But the youngest uh, girl, who was just a freshman and turned out to be probably the best player on the team and that didn't go over very well with her older with her older sisters and they got to nitpicking and, and we're not playing well together and so as they get into the into the tournament uh madison has to has to sit them down and you basically say uh either you pull it together or play together or i will not hesitate to just sit you on the bench for the entire tournament. And uh, so she handled them beautifully, unlike Lester, their dad was able to when he was mm. coaching. Uh, she was able to come in, lay down the law, and the girls fortunately responded and things went much better. Sometimes it needs a woman, and I'm not being sexist here in any way, anybody, to deal with some troublesome daughters. And we'll Absolutely. say no more. Ah. Wayne, let's turn to your other book now. That's, you know, shortly to come out, I believe, A Stone's Throw. Can you briefly tell us what this forthcoming book is about? Well, A Stone's Throw is intended for a, I would say, an upper middle grade audience, meaning like 11 to 14 years old. Uh, is the is the target audience uh, for that book and basically what the story is about it takes place in the 1960s that's the era and it's about a 12 year old girl uh, who is shuttled from a san francisco orphanage to a remote eastern montana ranch to live with a grandfather that she has never met and it's it becomes quite the challenge for both of them uh the grandfather is a uh, world war one vet uh homestead of his ground tough old bird like that that generation was and uh, all of a sudden uh, he's widowed uh living by himself and all of a sudden he's he's tasked with uh having a 12 year old granddaughter around the house. And so he's, he's just as scared as she is. And believe me, she's plenty, plenty nervous, uh, uh, coming from a San Francisco environment to something totally, totally different. And, uh, 
it's it's a in enjoying uh i think a charming i hope journey for the both of them oh indeed so let's have a look at you know you know again this is quite a going to be quite a chunky box uh with a lot of chapters so let's have a look at two of the chapters here wayne in this book now these chapters are next to each other everybody um the trip to montana is uh comes first uh which is about the journey from san francisco to montana and then the following chapter is the first day on the ranch which you start by saying it was dark when we arrived at the ranch as we drove down a dirt lane towards the house and outbuildings i could see from the dim yard light that a dog was racing towards the car and for maggie the main character here you're saying that this chapter is a shock to the system for maggie and that's why you wanted to talk about it tell us about these two chapters yes and, uh... You know, I think first the uh, the trip to Montana, she is totally surprised when her grandfather, Ira Stone, shows up at the orphanage to, to claim, basically claim her uh, as a relative, which is the only way she could really get out of the orphanage. And uh, so he, She's shocked, first of all, because she's she's never met him. And in fact, she wouldn't have really known if he was dead or alive. And uh, so that was a that was a shock to begin with. And then she starts the long journey, the two day journey from San Francisco, California, to the fictional town of Sandstone Springs, Montana, which is two long days in the car. She realizes as they're going along there, my gosh, I'm going to have to, we're going to stay at the same motel room tonight. Uh, this, this guy is scary. Uh, he has a, he was wounded in World War One. has a large, uh, took some shrapnel uh, on the cheek. So he's got a long, deep scar on one side of his face. So he kind of looks like a, a bit like a monster. And uh, so she's obviously as a little 12 year old girl, she is, she is frightened. And uh, he doesn't know what to say. She tries to initiate some conversation. Uh, he's having none of it. Uh, uh, not because he doesn't want to, he just doesn't know how. <laughs> and uh, so that's a scary uh, two days uh, for her realizing that she's leaving her whole old life in San Francisco behind. The first day on the ranch, I think, points out uh, a little bit of her uh, resiliency. And uh, she's all of a sudden for living in a rental in San Francisco. They didn't even have a, a they didn't have a dog, didn't have a cat. And all of a sudden, here's a Here's a dog racing up, uh, racing up the lane as they as they come in there. Before you know it, uh, uh, she's doing chores. Uh, I mean, there's no no fooling around with with Ira. Uh, he says, you know, you're you got to work. Uh, ranch ranch people do, and so pretty soon she's gathering eggs eggs and cleaning chicken houses, and she's. She's out uh, bottle feeding uh, orphan calves and getting introduced into the whole ranch life and, and animals. And uh, so I think that that chapter just shows the stark contrast of uh, her former life and to what she's suddenly uh, been thrust into. There you go, everyone. There's a bit of insight to the next book. Thank you, Wayne, for, you know, these wonderful stories, you know, on letting us, you know, giving us a glimpse into your world of books and writing. You know, who do you see, Wayne, as the market for your books? Or more importantly, who would you like to see reading your books? Everybody? Just kids? Who? Well, I think, uh, you know, obviously the children's, book could be 
any any audience. You really don't have to have to live in the country to uh, to appreciate the Buster story. I don't think. Uh, I would think with Pacer Cooley, uh, you know, uh, I think anybody that that likes sports, uh, uh, certainly anybody that's growing up in a in a rural setting, whether it be in Montana or anywhere across the Midwest or in in, uh, in rural England, I think uh, people might enjoy it or rural. Uh, 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 Canada, Australia, or you know, what, oh, yeah. or whatever. I mean, it's. I don't think you have to be from Montana and from a rural town in Montana to enjoy it. But I do think that probably the target audience is people that, uh, because it is a, a book that's fairly concentrated on on sports. Uh, you know, if you're a sports fan, I think you'd uh, uh, enjoy it and. It's obviously an older audience. I uh, I tell people it's uh, there is some rough language in Pacer Cooley. Uh, uh, it's certainly not a, a politically correct uh, book. We we make some we laugh about ourselves. Uh, from there's Brit characters uh, in there. There's Irish characters, and I think the one nice thing that the book does is uh, back in the days, uh, I think it takes us back into the days where we can actually uh, laugh at ourselves. Oh, a absolutely. Little bit, you know, <laughs> without having to be, be so politically proper. Uh, so I think it's, I tell people that's a, probably a PG rated book. I think uh, older high school kids and an adult will, uh, will enjoy that, that book. Uh, I think a stone's throw, uh, of course, the intended intended audience of 11 through 14 is certainly who I'm hoping for there. But I also think it's a book that adults would would enjoy. It's a it's kind of a delightful, charming story, and uh, uh, I don't think you have to be I don't think you have to be 14 to enjoy it. I, I think an adult would as well. Where can people get your books from, Wayne? Well, I'm on, you can go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Goodreads. Uh, uh, they're, they're available on, on all of those. Uh, they're available as, a, as an ebook. And uh, I also uh, have a website that you can go to and uh, purchase them off of that. Brilliant. Wayne Edwards, thank you very much. As I say at the end of my podcast every week, I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. So until next time, stay safe.